So they've got 222 Republicans in this 118th Congress. Kevin McCarthy needs 218 of them to vote for him to become Speaker. That means he can only lose four votes, and you have these five who say they're never Kevin's. So you do the math on that. He does not have the votes as we sit here this morning. May get there, but he has made concessions to them already. And when Marjorie Taylor Greene is the voice of reason coming out and saying to those five, hey, guys, take a win when you have one in front of you. Let's make Kevin McCarthy the speaker. He's given you a whole bunch of stuff that you asked for. Let's get this process moving and not start our Congress in absolute chaos, which is what it would be if he doesn't reach that 218th. They have to go to a second ballot. Other candidates come in. This could go on for days and days and days. Not the way most Republicans, anyway, want to start this Congress. Well, and I mean, what Kevin McCarthy should do, uh, not that Kevin McCarthy would ever take my advice, but Kevin McCarthy should go to the floor like we're hearing he may do. He should fight it out. He should call their bluff. And and I would have one Republican after another Republican after another Republican go to the floor and attack however few people there are and say, you are a minority. You are outvoted 200 and whatever, 215 to five. And you're destroying the Republican Party. And and um, because. He's never going to be able to negotiate with them. He's going to have to run them over. He's just, and if he can't run it over, and if these five people are going to hold him hostage, his speakership hostage for the next two years, it's not a speakership worth having. Exactly. And by the way, they don't have anybody to, to, to replace McCarthy. So call their bluff. I, it's, it's, it's really his only good option at this point. Well, the vote on the next Speaker of the House seems unlikely to be decided on the first ballot, something that hasn't happened in 100 years. In what could be a premature move, incoming Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy continued to move his belongings into the Speaker's office yesterday in advance of today's vote. He's moving in. McCarthy, who has long been jockeying for the top job in the House, has spent the last several weeks trying to whip the 218 votes needed to take the gavel. The California Republican can afford just four defections from within his own party and still be elected speaker. But as Willie mentioned, as of last night, five Republicans had publicly vowed to vote against McCarthy's speakership bid. And another nine signed a letter on Sunday telling McCarthy he had not done enough to earn their support. NBC News briefly caught up with McCarthy yesterday. Do you have the votes for Speaker locked in tomorrow? I think we're going to have a good day tomorrow. Are you prepared to make more concessions in exchange for more support? I hope you all have a very nice New Year's. Let's bring in the founder of the conservative website, The Bulwark, Charlie Sykes and former White House press secretary, now an MSNBC host, Jen Psaki. Good to have you both. So, Charlie, this uh, this job has been unmanageable for Republicans since people like me uh, were in Washington for probably because of people like me in Washington. You ask John Boehner, job wasn't worth it for John. You ask Paul Ryan, Paul put up with it for a while, but just wasn't worth it for Paul, a guy that you and I know very well. And now you have McCarthy trying to get this job. And and again, I mean, trying to get it at a, at a low point for Republicans where where every swing voter, you know, most swing voters think they're insurrectionists, weirdos and freaks. And these five, six, seven Republicans are doing their damnedest to prove that what they're saying about them is true. Yeah, and there are no good options for Kevin McCarthy. I mean, he has been trying to shrink himself and self-humiliate himself into this position now for months, and amazingly, it's not, it is not working. So what you're going to see on display is an unruly, dysfunctional party that is uninterested in governing. And as you point out, Joe, though, this didn't just happen. I mean, this has been building for years. Uh, you have been creating this political environment with all of the incentives for nihilism, uh, for bomb throwing. Um, and, and, you know, many of these, these folks, you know, have been, I mean, this, this, this moment 
has been coming for a very long time. And it certainly reflects what's happened to the Republican Party that is no longer really interested in being a serious public policy party. It doesn't have a, a detailed legislative agenda. And when you have a party that's turned itself uh, over to a cult of personality, to bomb throwers, uh, to grifters, um, we shouldn't be surprised to see that we are going to have on display uh, this amazing clown car. And by the way, all the focus is on, of course, these uh, these five holdouts here. But think about Kevin McCarthy, whose speakership now rests on the vote of people like um, George Santos and Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, the closer <laughs> you God. look, the worse this gets for the Republican the Party. On yeah. the day that should yeah. have been the big celebration of the red wave. So think about this alternative reality. Normally, when a political party takes power, uh, this is a moment of celebration. People are feeling mm -hmm. good. They're celebrating. And you are not going to be seeing that over the next 12 hours in Washington, D.C. Well, as, as, I always, as I keep trying to remind my former Republican brothers and sisters, it didn't have to be this way. They didn't have to follow Donald Trump down the rabbit hole. They didn't have to push QAnon conspiracy theories. They didn't have to push election denying. They didn't have to be the radical sure. extremists that they were. They made the choice. And these and are it's, the consequences. This is a consequence. You lose the yep. Senate and the House is, is a dumpster fire. 